Well, good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who are central time zone or east of here, it is uh, straight up noon on Friday, and uh, welcome to another episode of Bridges Conversations. Today, I'm speaking with my friend Carol Atwell Ackles of the Ignatian Spiritual Out Spirituality Institute in Dallas. And we're going to be talking about imagination, boldness, and joy, which I love. I love that title that we ended up on. Uh, let me tell you just a bit about uh, Carol. Uh, she's going to tell you a little bit more, but uh, Carol is uh, a, a seasoned a guide in Ignatian spirituality and prayer. She gives uh, programs and days of reflection, retreats. Um, she launched and continues to give workshops that shape persons, Jesuits and lay people both, who are moving into retreat ministry and spiritual companioning in the Ignatian tradition. She served six years on the Jesuit by province commission on ministry a group that discerns long-range planning for apostolic work of the Jesuits and their colleagues. She's the co-author with Father Joe Tetlow of the 12-week Ignatian retreat, Finding Christ in the World. And she's also worked with her colleague in Dallas, Father Anthony Barrow, uh, developing a Toward Greater Freedom retreat for parents at Jesuit College Prep in Dallas. She, we, we won't hold this against her, but she used to be a, a lawyer, you know, or I guess still is a lawyer, I don't know, but uh, holds a JD from SMU um, and also a, a master's in theology and leadership from uh, Gonzaga University in Spokane. Her and her husband reside in Dallas and are the parents of five children, all grown and out of the nest, I assume. So, uh, so welcome. Uh, Carol, why don't we begin as we kind of always do, besides all that that I just said, tell us a little bit about you and your background and, and how you made your way into this work of Ignatian spirituality and the exercises. Well, thank you. Well, thank, first, I just want to thank you, Steve, for inviting me. Um, it's always a delight to have conversations with you. And um, so I thank you very much for having me. Um, I grew up on a farm. I'm a Texas farm girl, <laughs> and um, somehow it uh, came to my mind when I was around 10 that I wanted to be a lawyer. I had no idea why. I didn't know any lawyers. There were no lawyers in my family. I was out in the country. <laughs> so, um, but I pursued that, and... Um, and I did practice law for a couple of years, and but we were married and we started having children. And uh, when I became pregnant with our third child in three years, I kind of understood that God had something else in mind. <laughs> so uh, I haven't practiced law um, now for a long time. My husband is an attorney, though, so I still listen a lot <laughs> um, to legal things. Um, it was my husband that introduced me to the Jesuits and he was Jesuit educated here in Dallas and at university at Spring Hill. And, um, and then when our son, our oldest son began high school at Jesuit is when I really came into relationship with the society of Jesus. And um, I, what I learned was that my spirituality was Ignatian and had always been Ignatian. I just didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know there was a name for it. I got that um, feeling. Yeah. 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 So, um, it, so by the grace of God, I um, began friendships and relationships with some Jesuits here and um, was able to make retreats and, um, be in spiritual direction with Jesuits. And then Joe Tetlow came to town <laughs> and things really started going fast. <laughs> and um, Joe was first uh, my spiritual mentor and guide and formator. And now he's uh, my dearest friend. And uh, so, um, and we continue to work together, which is a great joy um, to me. 
So I would say, you know, it just has unfolded. And as Joe would actually say, you know, it just, we, I would just take the next step. It would just be the next thing. And, and, it, and it unfolded. And, and primarily in terms of the work I do now in spiritual direction, <coughs> excuse me, spiritual direction retreats and everything, there were other people who invited that out of me. I didn't see it in my own self. Um, so it, it was the Jesuits I was working with, my own family, uh, my friends, um, certainly Joe, and they invited, they saw in me things I could not see and, and, and helped shape and form that and invited this work from me. And so I'm grateful to the people in my life um, whom the Lord has gave, right? <laughs> and the Lord, uh, um, the Lord has said that and that's the way I've been guided. I've had good shepherds. So thank you for all that. Yeah. Um, well, let's kind of launch into this title that you and I landed on because it's, it's intriguing. Um, you know, we just finished uh, those of us involved in this work at all will know that we just finished um, celebrating what was called the Ignatian year, which was the 500th anniversary of Ignatius Loyola's wounding and his conversion, his cannonball moment. Um, and when you and I were talking, you, you said something that really intrigued me is that there, there's much more to this conversion um, than a cannonball, obviously. <laughs> Yes. And um, you, you said to me somewhere something along the line of is that he was converted uh, not by a cannonball, but by his imagination and his capacity to imagine. So let's start there. Um, tell us more about that. Well, as you mentioned, uh, the Ignatian year was a, a wonderful year and it it reconnected us to our to some roots and to Ignatius's experience. Um, I remember seeing a title though of an article during that year that the title of the article was the cannonball that made us that can, that made a saint. And I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> no cannonballs don't make saints. <laughs> um, um, it wasn't a cannonball that converted Ignatius. God converted Ignatius. And, and I felt like the Ignatian year invited us to look at how did God operate? What did God do? How did God invite Ignatius? And, um, and, and how, how was Ignatius able, what capacities and what we know is that, God comes to us as we are and works with who we are and how we are. And so what was it in Ignatius that, that really launched and solidified um, this conversion that was so profound? And it, God used, the Holy Spirit used uh, Ignatius's imagination, um, his capacity to daydream his capacity to um, think outside the box, to think differently about his own life and his own faith. And um, so I think it's just, a, it's a way that the Holy Spirit, I, I think we tend to think of the Holy Spirit or the Lord working through our intellect we're rationalists and, you know, so, um, and, a, and um, a lot of our own imagination has been replaced um, by, by media, by, um, you know, in Ignatius times, there was no TV, <laughs> there was no internet, there, no YouTube to watch, you know, so. Um, God knows where we'd be if, you know, yeah. there have been YouTube back then. Right. So. Well, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying those are bad things. I don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. right. I, I just, I'm, I think in our day, 
the Lord is probably using YouTube because <laughs> there's imagination there, creativity there, and TV and movies and anything. I don't, I don't think, I think what we want to understand is that we, sh we need not limit the way that the Lord can work. And the imagination, our capacity to daydream, our capacity to imagine differently, um, creates a space for God to work in our lives. So it's very important. Yeah. Listen, we have, uh, we have a, a half dozen or so viewers. Um, if you guys have questions as we go, uh, feel free to just put them in the comment section right there on Facebook. I'll be watching for them. We'll, we'll maybe get to them a little bit later, but if you have questions as you go, um, please, please feel free to leave them. Let's get back to this, this thought of our imagination. Um, how do you think this, this need for our imaginative, imaginative capacity, our own, uh, plays itself out in the larger church today? Um, where, where are we using our imagination? Where are we lacking imagination? And, and what can we learn from Ignatius? Well, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, and I won't quote him correctly or accurately, but it's, it's the sense that Pope Francis has given us of, that our strength in the church is not the system, is not the institution, it's not the organization, um, that our strength lies in the mystery of God, in the waters that that are the mystery of God. And um, so our, it's important that we be in touch with our imaginative capacities and allow God to operate outside of a box in our, um, in our way of thinking. And, and there's a lot that we say about tradition and um, but we can get attached to things um there there was a piece that uh, father matt jesuit father matt malone who was editor of american magazine at the time and he wrote a piece for on community discernment for for a community discernment and he was talking about this imagination and how we need it um it's something we that we really need in the church today pope francis is talking a lot about it um, it's part of the undergirding of the synodality and all, but, um, but, um, Matt told a story, um, and I thought it was so profound. He, he told, there's a tribe of, um, they're Amerindians and they live in, um, New Guyana in, down in Central America, I think it is, right, or South America near the equator. In this tribe, the Jesuits um, met this tribe. It's been right at 100 years. So the church in this area of the world has, is, has only been there for about 100 years. So just even that's pretty fascinating. And um, a, they see a priest about once a month. And um, for the, and they receive uh, the you know they have mass and um, receive the sacrament of reconciliation, but the rest of the time these people are caring for each other. They're baptizing and um, preaching and um, burying the dead, and um, the priest leaves um, enough communion for a month, and they. <laughs> You know, so, um, and it's a very vibrant, these are a vibrant, joyful people of faith, community of faith. So you think about them and then, and then you look at our own experience in the United States. I live in Dallas, Texas. 
I am very near five parishes. I can walk to one. I can drive to the other four within five minutes. Um, I can go to daily mass at any of these parishes. I could go at 6.30. I could go at 6.45. I could go at 8. I could go at 8.30. I can go at 11.30. I can go at noon. I can go at 12.10 or I can go at 5.30. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> right? Every day. And... Um, So I think, I mean, we if we think, we can get so, I, I get the question is, how much of our tradition, um, we hear a lot about um, lack of priests and um, churches closing and, but how much of our really tradition of faith is just cult, is more our comfort level and our cultural comfort level. The Amerindians are not any less Catholic than I am. So it just, it causes me, and I think it should cause, it might cause, not should, but might, cause all of us to wonder about what's the Holy Spirit doing here? Mm. What do we need, what should we be stepping into? And uh, I think that that's the, um, how might we imagine things differently? Tradition isn't about the worship of ashes. Uh, it's about the passing on a fire. So that's from Gustav Mahler. And, you know, the very word tradition means to pass forward. It's rooted in Latin. So, so that's what I mean by imagine. I mean, that's yeah. what I, my thought. I don't know what you're thinking, Steve, but. Yeah, no, it's good. And speaking of fire, uh, you know, um, being on fire, in one of your presentations that you shared with me, you talk about three essential characteristics for those whose hearts are on fire for Jesus. And I think a lot of us want to be there or, or maybe feel like we are there. Um, and those three elements um, or characteristics are imagination, boldness, and joy, kind of our theme for today. We've talked a little bit about imagination a little bit. Let's move on to joy. How, how, does, how does joy fit into all this? Well, joy, um, joy is our greatest tool. It's our greatest, it's our most effective tool, as your banner says. It's like a magnet. I mean, think about it in your own life. Um, who are you drawn to? Are you drawn to people who are droll and look like they haven't had a joyful thought in 10 years? <laughs> <You know? laughs> or are you drawn to more joyful people? Um, and I'm not talking here about happy. I, I'm talking about that interior, an interior hum, you know, a person who really, um, who really, oh, I love the quote that you put there from Pope Francis, a person who's not convinced, enthusiastic, certain, and in love will convince nobody. Well, I think we need to look in the mirror. Are, are we that are we that person? Are we enthousi enthusiastic? I do want to say something about certain. Certain isn't about having all the answers. The certainty Pope Francis is talking about there and the certainty we talk about in our life of faith is that we're certain that God is at work. We're certain that God is always laboring in love to bring about the better outcome. That's what we're certain of. And we're certain of God's love for me. Um, so it's not about having all the answers or knowing how everything's going to work out or anything like that. So, um, And that joy, as you mentioned to me earlier, also includes uh, awareness of within that joy suffering, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty convinced you can't, be authentically joyful without suffering. 
uh, there's there's too many there's too many witnesses. Um, I think of my own Aunt Arby. Um, she lived to be 92, and she was a woman of great faith. That was the gift she gave to me and to our family. But she also was the person she she was the personification of joy. I mean, she was just so joyful. Um, and you all your your life always felt lighter after you left her um, or after being with her. And um, she had her only son had been who she adored was killed in World War II. And then her husband drowned four years later. So this is a woman who lived really the bulk of her life. She was very, very poor. She grew up very, very poor. She lived very, very modestly. Um, and um, yet she had this joy about her. And it, it, was, it was because it was rooted in this certainty that of, of being loved and in her love of, of the Lord. And so I think that um, it's kind of like um, it just it has to do with the experience. I think that unless we know some some shape of of suffering, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be tragic or traumatic, but unless we have some sense of disappointment or some sense of suffering, um, that's how we grow in the appreciation of all of the things. And that's where joy is rooted. So, um, so it's, it's always about, you know, which is the way it is with the Lord. It's always both hand. <laughs> But joy is our greatest magnet. Um, Jesus, Jesus says to us, said very clearly, you are my witness. You are. And um, so when we look around, who are our greatest witnesses and who are we attracted to? And we're attracted to people who exude joy. And um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about that? I do. I, I like that very much. And I think the last part of this, and we're, we, we're this is how fast this time goes. When we're having <laughs> good Sorry. No, no, it's good. We got maybe five or minutes left wait, or so. Uh, but when you have that imagination, and you and you're aware of that joy, and you exude that joy. Um, the final characteristic that you talk about is then is bold, being bold, right? You can't have that joy and have that emotion and and go hide it away somewhere, right? So so what's this next step um, like? A heart seized by Jesus navigates life with boldness. Um, he once told me. So. Um. Well, the first who comes to mind is um, Peter and the early apostles in, in Acts. Um, people were drawn to them in, at the temple, and they kept going to the temple, and people were drawn to them. And there's the story. They get called in by the high priest. And even the high priest in the story, it's scripture reads uh, that the priests were impressed by their boldness. And it's where they say, you know, okay, we can listen to you or we can listen to God. We're going to listen to God. <laughs> so, and they went back out and, you know, you do what you need to do, but we're going to go do this. So there's this, uh, <clears throat> there's this boldness, right? We see it right away. We certainly saw boldness in Jesus. See that. Um, and we see it in Ignatius. I mean, think about how bold. Um, he was very bold. 
even before the Society of Jesus and he decided he was going to go to Jerusalem and then that didn't work out. And then he decided he needed to learn Latin. So he sat with schoolboys. That takes a real, you know, <laughs> boldness <laughs> to do that. And then the boldness of, of the Society of Jesus. And uh, he was jailed um, several times because of his boldness, because he wouldn't, uh, he knew what he was talking about and he wasn't going to say that he didn't know what he was talking about. And so um, I think we need to be, we need to understand that this is part of our call. It's part of our heritage and it's part of our call to be bold. Um, in our culture, you know, there's the, what's it called? The fortune 500. I think that's called or the SP, I don't know. But there's this index and it, the top number of uh, companies in the world today. Well, the life expectancy of those companies is 21 years. Now we think, oh man, they're so successful and they've got it all figured out and everything. And the likelihood is, is by the time my grandson's 21, you know, they're just going to be an old company and if they're still existing. So, um, Compare that to the church, mm -hmm. which is the only institution besides the synagogue that survived the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, that we should be bold. We should be encouraged by that. But that doesn't mean we rest on it. We also should be entrepreneurial. And um, um, innovative. Mm -hmm. I always love what... Father Greg Boyle says, anything worth doing, anything worth doing is worth failing in. I just love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, we need not, you know, Jesus was always saying, be not afraid. Now, that doesn't mean that we just go around doing what we want to do. Our boldness is rooted in God. It's not just Carol being bold or Carol doing what she wants to do because she's a strong personality or Steve deciding he wants to, you know, it's not that. It's being rooted in God. It's trusting in what God is doing and uh, trusting what God is asking and trust, trusting that God trusts me, mm. right? Trusts us mm. to do. So, um, so that's what we mean by, uh, you know, a heart seized by Jesus that's prayerful and listening to Jesus. You know, there's a boldness involved in that. It's not about telling people. It's not a boldness about, you know, getting in people's face or confrontation. It's not that. It's about being a witness. Mm. How bold are we as, as witnesses? How bold is the church? How entrepreneurial are we as a community? Um, yeah. Those are the yeah. sorts of questions I would ask you. Yeah. Uh, we have just a, a few minutes left. If anybody out there has a question, please pop it in the comment box real quick. Um, if not, I probably have one more that I can uh, ask, but I wanted to give people a chance. If you're, I know you're there, but I know it's not always uh, possible to format that question on the fly. But um, let me, let me, while we're waiting to see if anybody has a question, um, you, when you talk about this, you know, being innovative, using our imagination, being out there with joy, being bold, um, but doing it for a purpose, as you say, it's not, it's not Carol, it's not Steve. Um, this is the idea of, of being on mission, of being disciples like, like the early disciples who were called were disciples. Uh, what is that? It's kind of obvious, but what does that mean for us today to be on mission? What's our role in in building the kingdom? It's interesting. I was just doing some reading this morning and, um, from Father Keenan's new book, um, and he's talking about that very subject. And um, in the excerpt, in the Gospels, 
and thereby in the exercises, spiritual exercises, there's no separation between Jesus and his mission. Jesus is the man on mission. Um, uh, Jesus is mission. Um, and um, what that, you know, how does that inform um, discipleship really is the word we're asking uh, is the, is the way it, uh, I might frame it. Um, what that, in part, what that means for us today is that the kingdom is always on the horizon. It's, it's here. It's, it, we like to say it's now and not yet. Mm. Um, but Jesus is always with us and walking with us, but Jesus is also always on the horizon. Yeah. And we're following that we're stepping into that now as as joe tello would say and i i'm one of those that's i'm really good about getting out in front of god so i always have to rein it in some but you know taking the next step into that into that um so and and father james hanby talks about our discernment is always a theological act. We're not just making a decision about, um, you know, do I buy this car or that? It's, it's the discernment, authentic discernment, always involves what is the thing to do that brings the kingdom? Hmm. That brings the kingdom deeper into me, God's life in me, makes it deeper and more alive, that brings the kingdom into my life world that makes God's presence and love deeper and more alive in my family, among my friends and the work that I do. So I think that, I mean, that's kind of really broad and I'd have to think about it more, but I think that when we're, it's both, it's both larger. I think of Galileo's story about the sun and the sun is really large, like the sun holds the whole universe together and holds all the planets in orbit. But at the same time, it's ripening one grape on the vine. And that's the way God works. And that's the way the kingdom is, I think. Um, it, there's this larger context we want to be in touch with, but we, but we also are always bringing it what does that mean for me? Where is the Lord inviting me? Where is the kingdom that I'm living in? Um, and how do I, what is it that I do that helps it keep coming? Yeah. The kingdom come. Listen, so we have one question that came in from um, our friend, Pat Nearly Jordan, who's uh, a part of our community here in St. Louis. I, this is a big question, obviously, but I, I thought I'd put it to you uh, as a way to kind of wrap up what we're doing here today. You know, if you had to give one of those proverbial elevator speeches, if someone cornered you and say and said, yeah, I, I hear you, but how has this stuff actually changed your life? Um, what, what, would your, what would your response to be? What, what's been the biggest impact of this in your life, do you think, that this being a nation spirituality and practices and um yeah i'll let you think well, I, can, <laughs> I can answer that you know take another 45 days and answer that um but honestly i it to just kind of boil it uh all down i would say freedom i would say freedom the freedom that I experience, I certainly experienced it. That was the greatest fruit for me in the ex, of the spiritual exercises. Um, <clears throat> I came to know the Lord better and to know Jesus better, but I'm so grateful that I came to know me better and Jesus reveals me to me which is what Jesus does. He reveals God the Father to us, but he also reveals us to us. <clears throat> and I think the freedom to 
and, and of course, that's an ongoing thing. That's not stagnant. It's not like, oh, now I'm free. <laughs> it's not like that. There are attachments that form. So the awareness that attach, just even that awareness that attachments can form and um, being free enough um, to recognize those and uh, humbly ask the Lord to free you and of them. So I would say in terms of changing my life, um, Ignatian practices and recognizing and growing in, making progress in, as Ignatius would say, um, it would be I'm, I'm ever growing um, in freedom. And, and ultimately what that means, I'm ever growing into being coming being and becoming the person that God is creating every moment. Thank you for that. Um, just to, as we wrap up here, if, if you've run across this uh, broadcast and don't know much about who we are, uh, we are the Bridges Foundation. We're located in St. Louis, and we offer retreats and other programs um, that are based in the Ignatian spirituality and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. So if you'd like to know more about that, please check out our website. You can reach me through that website. Um, if you want to know more about Carol and what she's doing in Dallas, including some other online programs and things like that, please check out her website at the, at the Institute, which is IgnatianInstitute.org. Carol, you also, I don't know if you've got any coming up, but you, you're not a stranger to St. Louis. You, you give retreats. I'll be at, there next week. <laughs> at, at White House? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So she does come from time to time and, and give retreats at White House. So uh, check that out um, also. Yeah. Um, also, as we wrap up here, our next um, episode will be on Friday, March 3rd. Um, I'll be talking with one of our longtime uh, prayer companions, Pam Mason, who's worked uh, for many years at St. Matthew the Apostle Parish in a traditionally African-American neighborhood in St. Louis. It's the, the second Jesuit parish in St. Louis besides uh, College Church at St. Louis University. So uh, looking forward to, to speaking with Pam. Well, thank you, uh, Carol, very much. It's I knew this would be fun. Uh, yeah. If you all caught just the end of this or something, uh, it'll be available for view both on the Facebook page and on our, our website. So Check that out if you want to send it to someone or, or view it again. Um, I think that's what we have for now. Thanks for all of you for joining in. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Steve. And if you want to hold on a minute, I'll just talk to you for a minute after sure. we go. But, all right. All right. Thank you. We'll see you, you all next time.